I know that for a lot of you, this isn't what you want to hear. You're going to tell me how much your kid loves it and how happy they are. And once upon a time, I would have said the exact same thing. This is not an easy video for me to make. And if you're new here and this is the first one of my videos you've come across, my name is Cami. I am autistic. My husband is autistic and so are all five of our kids. Today, I am going to be talking about ABA. ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis and it is pretty controversial in the autism community. I also have a personal history with ABA. Two of our daughters were. When Maggie was diagnosed and we found out that she was autistic, I knew next to nothing about autism. I was so afraid for her future. Everyone from social workers to doctors to therapists acted like ABA was the answer. We were told ABA was the only evidence-based treatment for autism. Already from what I'd read, I knew I didn't want her to be cured. We had a meeting at the very beginning beginning where I talked about my concerns and all my concerns were put to rest. We absolutely don't do this. This is the new ABA. It wasn't the old ABA. All those things you hear, which is why our girls together were in a combined nine years of ABA, seven years for Maggie and two years for Tessie. That is one of my biggest regrets and it's one of the reasons I'm making this video because I can't change the past. I can tell you what I've learned, um, both as a parent who sat in literally thousands of hours of ABA sessions because Maggie's first two years were in home, five to six days a week, and I was there for every single one of those. I've been to a lot of ABA parent trainings. In the past, I've talked a lot about my own experiences and what we saw with our girls, and I will mention that briefly here. But I also really want to talk today about why I disagree with ABA, why I don't think it's the right therapy even now, even nice or modern ABA and not the old way. Yeah, thank you for not hitting, shocking, screaming at, and punishing autistic kids in the same ways that they were before. But I still have a lot of problems with how ABA is done. This is the information that I wish I had had going in because there was definitely not as much out there as there is now about why not to do ABA. These are my five top reasons that I really don't think ABA is a good idea for anyone. I know a lot of people want to detach ABA in practice from what ABA has been in the past, from what it was. But I think we really have to start out with talking about what ABA is based in in order to understand it and why it's problematic. ABA is based in behaviorism. Behaviorism is the idea that our behavior comes from interactions with our environment. The biggest problem with this approach, or one of the big problems with this approach, is that it only looks at things that can actually be measured, behaviors that can be observed outwardly. It completely discounts other things like genetics and the person's health, but it also discounts everything that can't be measured like emotions, past trauma, thoughts and feelings, <laughs> all of that, because those are not measurable things. But they're part of the human existence and they're important. So I'm going to take you back to the start of ABA, which was in 1960 and it was began by Ol Ivar Lovas. Now Lovas worked at UCLA and he came up with the idea of using this thing he'd created, ABA, to condition autistic children. I think it's important to know what Lovas believed about autistic children and autistic people to really understand where ABA starts from. Lovas is quoted once as saying, you see, you start pretty much from scratch when you work with an autistic child. You have a person in the physical sense. They have hair, a nose, and a mouth, but they are not people in the psychological sense. One way to look at the job of helping autistic kids is to see it as a matter of constructing a person. You have the raw materials, but you have to build the person. And there's just so much that's wrong with that statement, just like there's so much wrong with the therapy that was born from that mindset. I can show you videos of ABA being done. There's a great video by Stephanie Bethany that I am going to link down below that was really what got me personally thinking about ABA and what led to my kids being pulled out of it. I know that if I show you those videos, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, that's the old ABA. It's not like that now. In some places, that's true. Some places do still do that. An example is the Judge Rothenberg Center, where they use electric shock, shock and where they have fought in court to continue to use electric shock to punish autistic people, children, and adults. But since I hear so much of our ABA isn't like that, or we do the new ABA, that's what I'm going to address today, because I feel like that is that is the thing that people cling to that makes them think it's still acceptable when there's still a lot wrong with ABA. There's something else that I want to address, and that is the idea of ABA and it works. One of the arguments for ABA is that ABA is effective, and I won't argue that. We saw major behavioral changes in both of our girls 
when they started ABA. They were way more compliant because ABA trained them to be compliant. But just because something is effective doesn't mean that it's good. And we're going to get into that towards the end of this video. The first thing that I intensely dislike about ABA is the process of pairing. If you put your kid into an ABA center, one of the things they do is they give you a huge packet of paper. A large part of this packet of papers is going to be devoted to your child's likes and dislikes. Sensory-wise, games they like to play. This seemed pretty wonderful to me when both of our girls started, but I didn't totally understand how it was used. When your child starts ABA, they begin by being paired both with their BCBA, which is the person who designs the program, and with their BT, behavioral technician, who is the one who usually is working with your child day in and day out. Pairing is when an ABA practitioner pairs themselves with all of your child's favorite things and establishes that your child will have to go through them to get their favorite things. In the beginning, it's all about fun and no demands and that this is the person that has access to all of the good things that they can get during the many many hours when they're in ABA therapy. One thing that I hear frequently is that my child loves their BCBA or my child loves their BT. They look forward to it. They're so excited to go. This is the person who has access to all things fun and good as long as they're compliant. I know a lot of BCBAs and BTs who are good amazing people. They think it helps. I strongly disagree that long term it's good for autistic children to go through ABA, but I wouldn't question the motives of some of the people that I know and care about who absolutely believe this. I just think that it's still wrong, and that if you really look at the way it's used, even now, I still think it's wrong. There's a good chance that your child loves their BCBA and their BT because that is part of what pairing is. It is making them associate this person with everything that's good, and it's also making it so that when this person withdraws their attention and their approval, that that is a negative enough thing that it affects the child's behavior. Honestly, one of the things that disturbs me about ABA and pairing is how much ABA pairing looks like love bombing. Love bombing is oftentimes part of a cycle in an abusive relationship. These are quotes about love bombing from various doctors but I couldn't help but be struck by how much they matched up with ABA pairing. Anthology professor Gary Ann Galanti explained, a basic need is for self-esteem. Basically, love bombing consists of giving someone a lot of positive attention. Dr. Hans Brader, a neuroscientist at Harvard University, states, some people seem to be born with vulnerable dopamine systems that get hijacked by social rewards. The fact that people, especially with ADHD, but also with autism, often have problems with dopamine in their brain. It can be a reason we're bored easily, we're always looking for the next thing. This makes people who are autistic and who have ADHD especially vulnerable to this type of abuse. Psychologist Dale Archer explains the cycle of love bombing with the acronym IDD, which is intense idealization, devaluation, and discard. You don't get discarded in ABA mostly because patients who are in it full-time, their insurance is likely paying about a quarter of a million dollars a year. You don't have the discard, but the intense idealization and then the devaluation when that attention is withdrawn as a punishment because planned ignoring is very much still a part of the modern ABA. It's problematic. In love bombing, if a person doesn't comply with the demands of the person who holds the power, then their attention and affection and everything good is withdrawn. And that is a big part of how ABA works too. This is from a BCBA who writes at the blog, I love ABA, and she says, pairing is how therapists establish instructional control and connect themselves to reinforcement eventually becoming a reinforcer. This for me is one of the most upsetting parts of ABA. The person who is using this therapy is intentionally forcing a relationship with a person who very often has problems with establishing relationships. Not always, if you know one autistic person, you know one autistic person, but for a lot of us, forming social relationships is difficult. So you have this forced relationship where this person has paired themselves with everything positive and good and then can withdraw that attention and withdraw all of these good things they're giving if the child or adult doesn't do what the ABA practitioner wants them to do. Kids are trained to act excited and act happy even when they aren't feeling that way because they know that's the way they get to access the things that they want 
the attention that they want. Our kids learn through this that if they ignore their wants or their needs and just act happy all the time, that there won't be negative consequences, that they won't be ignored, they won't lose the things that are good. I strongly believe that this sets autistic children up to be abused. This grooms autistic people to be abused. It's everything you don't want for your child is that they are compliant because they know that being compliant is the only way that they get love and attention and sometimes food and water. This is like pairing to me. It is a basic part of ABA and it is so disturbing. The second thing that disturbs me the most about ABA is planned ignoring and pairing kind of led right up to planned ignoring. That relationship's been established and you have to have that relationship for being ignored to really bother you. I want you to think about how you feel when someone you care about ignores you and gives you the silent treatment. When you're trying to communicate with them how you're feeling, and your needs, and maybe you don't always have the words, but they just shut you out because you're not acting the way that they think you should act. That is painful. That is a negative consequence, and it's not the way we should be treating people, and especially vulnerable children. One of the moments in the weeks before our girls stopped ABA that really got me thinking, I was already starting to struggle with the ethics of ABA and what I was learning, but there was a day when I got called to Tessie's ABA center because she was sick. I had to go in through the front and through all these hallways. It was pretty. It was a pretty long walk to get to or Tessie was laying on her playmat. And I came into this hallway and one of the BTs was in the hallway. I'd seen this little girl there for a, a, the year and a half Tessie had been there. I believe she was a year older than Tessie. I never heard her say a single word in that entire time. She was always calm. I'd see her walking alongside her grandmother and she just, she always seemed very well behaved. They made it clear that Tessie was the most difficult child in the school. And at that point, Tessie was my easiest child. I walked into this hallway and the little girl was sitting at a table and her BT was standing with her back turned towards her with her arms crossed and she was saying that if she would just be good then she would pay attention to her. This child who was four looked so small and little and sad. The BT with her arms crossed standing up towering over this child with her back turned telling her that if she would be good she would pay attention to her. It just seemed so wrong to me. In my mind what I went back to was when I was a little kid and we went to Marine World and we went to the whale show. One of the whales did something it wasn't supposed to do. The trainer went over and turned his back on the whale and I don't know if this was part of the show or not. It got sent to time out in the corner and it went to this corner in this little tank and was basically crying. I was probably three or four when I saw this and I still remember it clearly because it was just so vividly, it felt so wrong. I felt so sad for that whale. Um, there were a lot of reasons to be sad for that whale. You could tell that the whale was hurting because of this withdrawal of attention. And this little girl was hurting for the exact same reason. I mean, the posture was even the same as the trainer at the whale show. So much of what people think of as negative autistic behaviors is us trying to communicate. It's not having the words to communicate what we're feeling, sometimes even having a hard time knowing exactly what we're feeling. Behavior is communication. It isn't being intentionally bad or disobedient. If you only measure the behavior, which is what happens at ABA, without measuring the motivation behind it, you miss out on how to help the person and you take things in totally the wrong direction and that is what planned ignoring is. I found when we cut out planned ignoring and I started asking Maggie what was wrong when she was melting down, that it completely changed the dynamic. And you would think, especially with people who speak less or who are non-speaking, that you would want to try to figure out what was wrong. Are they in pain? Why are they upset? Rather than just basing everything on the behavior that you see and how you can eliminate that behavior. That teaches the person to mask, mask pain, mask what they're feeling, mask their thoughts. My third problem with ABA is the use of food constantly as reinforcers. In all of the ABA that I have seen, food, specifically like sweets, in Tessie's classroom it was cupcakes and ice cream and candy was used with Maggie, a lot of the times it was popcorn because she loved popcorn. Food is used as a reinforcer. You work, you get this. You do what I want, you get a bite of a cupcake. The way you're te treating a child to think about food entirely as a reward is hugely problematic. Food as a treat is given when they do something right and it isn't given when they mess up. 
and that just isn't right. The next thing, the fourth thing that I don't like about ABA is the long hours for little kids. When our girls were little, the amount of hours that they were in ABA, it was presented as absolutely necessary. Like this is the only thing that can help your child. They need to be doing it as much as they can because this is the only way they're gonna function in society. And no one knows that. I absolutely disagree that you can tell an autistic child is very small what they're gonna be like as an adult. I've seen so many kids who've gotten such scary diagnoses that are chattering away when they're five. The development of all of our girls was very similar up until they were three when their language started going in different directions. The long hours, being an ABA from up to 40 hours a week. Tessie was an ABA four days a week only, but she was there from eight 30 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. Maggie was at ABA from 9 to 3.30 every day, five days a week. This starts as young as 18 months when kids are diagnosed. Tessie started ABA when she was 20 months old. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought the more therapy I could get her, the better the chance I was getting her in life. But knowing now what I know about ABA and seeing how much less anxious and stressed our girls were after we got out shows me just how wrong I was. We hear a lot about ABA, how it's evidence-based and how it's the only thing that will help your child. One of the problems I found on this whole evidence-based thing is that the motivation of the people doing these studies, a lot of times they are deeply invested in promoting ABA. It is a lucrative field to be in. Another problem was the number of studies that have a sample size of one. They'll tell you about how carefully the behavior is tracked and everything like that, but still, the sample size of some of these studies is one person. With small sample sizes, they can't effectively demonstrate that they're proving their hypothesis, and yet here we're accepting the sample size of one. I just, to me, that's one person. One study that I saw that supported ABA said that it was only effective as effective in practice 10% of the time. I think one of the problems with this, even implementing it as it's supposed to be, is that the people that are actually providing the ABA much of the time are BTs or behavioral technicians. Now to become a BT you need 40 hours of training, 15 hours of practice, and a high school diploma. When Tessie went to ABA, she was in a classroom where the BCBA was always there and it was all basically graduate students. And honestly, it was a lot stricter and more rigid than Maggie's ABA. I feel better actually about the ABA Maggie received than about what we put Tessie through because I think it was a lot more rigorous and soul crushing. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found out that was another nail in the coffin for ABA for me, I was in a meeting and I was told that one of the things they'd done was that Tessie, who had not yet turned four. She started at this center right after her second birthday. She was there until she was about three and a half. Anytime she would climb, and climbing was defined as lifting her foot off the ground, one foot off the ground and putting it on something. So one foot off the ground to not make a step. If she climbed up on anything while she was at ABA, she had to stop, she lost her playtime, she had to go sit down, and she had to do a non-preferred task, which for her was matching. Tessie was two and three and she was losing her playtime, having it taken away and having to go something, do something that they knew that she hated to try to cut out the behavior. ABA likes to call itself evidence-based, and I really can't argue with that because I feel like ABA does have fast results in some ways. ABA grooms children to be more compliant, and more compliant children are easier to control. It also sets them up to be abused. I think a good rule for deciding if a therapy is ethical is would you do it to a neurotypical child? Would you do it to your child? Pandemic happened and they were out of ABA and within two, pe two weeks Maggie was talking more. She was happier, she wasn't eloping. Eloping had been a major problem and it just stopped. She has not eloped since she's been out of ABA. I know that for a lot of you, this isn't what you wanna hear. You're gonna tell me how much your kid loves it and how happy they are. And once upon a time, I would have said the exact same thing. When you're basically training kids to act like they're happy, you can't really know whether or not they really are. And when the cracks start to show in that mask after years of being trained like this, when the anxiety of pushing down your real emotions to get approval finally comes out, it can be incredibly devastating, both for the kids who are subjected to it and when you realize what you've put your kid through. That is all. That's it for today. I know this is a long one, but it needed to be said. I've had dreams about making this video. Yeah. <laughs> That is it for today. If you like this video, I would love it if you'd give it a thumbs up. And this is one that I would love it if you would share. I don't think I've ever asked that before, but I think that this is important. But if you're interested in all things autism, I would love it if you'd hit subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.